Hey, I'm Don Amaro, and this is Through the Fire, a podcast about overcoming adversity, reframing misfortune, and celebrating courage. On this show, you're going to meet some really incredible people who have been through some heavy stuff, but they've come through the other side. And the hope is that you're encouraged and inspired by the words that you hear. My guest today has been making music and performing since the early 2000s, including a memorable stretch on the Canadian Idol stage. And just so you know, on this episode, we'll be talking about addiction and sobriety and the beautiful journey Theo Tams has been on. If you're struggling with something similar, please know you can find some resources in the episode notes or on the Through the Fire page at donamero.ca. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to Through the Fire. And uh, I'm joined today by the wonderful Theo Tams. Theo, I want to ask to start off. First of all, I want to say hi, because we have never actually met. Um, this is the first <laughs> time for you and me having some, some face-to-face no, exactly. computer time. Um, uh, how are you doing these days? I'm good. I feel like um, I'm definitely one of those people that I feel like at the start of every new year, I totally buy into the whole like New Year's resolution. I just feel like this surge of kind of renewal. So uh, I'm feeling good that it's a new year and uh, looking forward to the year ahead. It's a big year for me. I'm getting married this year. So yeah, it's uh, I'm excited. I wanted to ask you about that. When, when's the marriage? When's this when's the wedding happening? Uh, end of July. Okay. Yeah, we're That's doing cool. a we're we're chancing a, a summer outdoor wedding. So we'll see. Fingers crossed. Well, this is kind of interesting for me because um, you know I know we've not crossed paths before, but I've I've done a deep dive obviously into the Theo Tams world and uh, watched the documentary uh, on you that came mm. out I guess about a year and a half or two years ago now. Um, and yeah. fascinating story. Uh, you know, I don't know if you know this, but I I did Canadian Idol in two thousand six. Uh, didn't place, didn't end up in the top 22. I, they sent me home literally just before, uh, which I think in some ways wow. was kind of a, kind of a, a saving grace moment for me because it, it, it kind of opened mm-hmm. up doors in, a, in an interesting way for me. Um, but, uh, right. but yeah, so I, your Canadian Idol journey was, uh, was interesting to kind of see that unfold. And if you didn't know already, Theo won Canadian Idol back in 2008 um, and, uh, and has had a storied uh, journey since then. Uh, and, um, we're going to get into some of that here today. Um, within that documentary, uh, you talk about, um, how you accidentally came out as a gay man on Canadian Idol. Uh, yeah, it did, right. didn't seem like something you had intended to, to, to share publicly, especially at that point in time. No, I mean, um, you know, we want to talk blessings in disguise. I feel like <laughs> that, that definitely was one in a weird way. You know, I had I had come out to my parents about six months prior to that moment. So I had come out to them, I think, maybe a week or two before I auditioned for the show. Once I had made the choice to audition, I was just like, I have to at least come out to my parents, you know, just in case I end up making like the top 200 or, you know, if I end up making it further because I I was a fan of the show. I had watched it. So I know how the message boards work and I, I knew how you know, just, I I don't want to say mean, but I just knew the gossip that was surrounding all the contestants on the seasons previous to mine. So I I just knew that like, if I didn't at least tell my parents that like something was going to come up. Um, so yeah, it was the first live show. And, uh, I mean, you know how live TV works, especially when you're getting interviewed. It's like, you just try to talk as fluidly as you can without stumbling over your words. And, (laughs) I'm a pretty open guy. So I was just going stream of consciousness. And I answered this question. And uh, he said, you know, why did you end up choosing that song? And I was like, "Ah, you know, I just I was in a relationship. And, you know, I had to tell him it was too late to apologize. I sang apologize by One Republic. And I dropped the pronoun him. I told him it was too late to apologize. And it was that one kind of slip of the tongue that Mm. was it sounds so dramatic to say it was forever life changing, but I mean, if you're gonna come right. out, I rip the bandaid off and tell a country all at once. I guess, yeah. Right. Well, and that's what I mean by full circle, because now you you've gone from that to you're getting married this year to your partner. Uh, your partner's name is Sean. Sean, yeah, yeah, and uh, and so that's to me that feels like kind of. Uh, in, in an interesting way to kind of start off our conversation because it did start off in some ways the journey for you uh, in, in the public eye at least anyways and your story is um, so um, one that I find um, profound and 
powerful and uh, encouraging. My my first connection to you, strangely enough, was more recent. I I didn't know a whole lot. I, I think after I got booted off Idol, <laughs> I um I kind of I was like I'm done with Idol. I don't want to you know pay attention to it anymore. So I kind of didn't pay attention of for course. a long time. And um we maybe found each other on Instagram somewhere and um and I was immediately enamored with your voice. I mean you have this incredible control. Uh, I'm drawn to voice more than anything else. More than sometimes more than melody, more than lyric. I'm drawn to voice, and you've got one of those voices that's like undeniable. I mean, obviously, you know, as, as a, as a winner of Canadian Idol and, and, you know, many have vouched for that voice. Um, I, uh, I, so I was, I was blown away by that. And, and I think, uh, from there I've, I've become oh, a fan of you. yours within this, the context of, of this conversation, I think there's a lot of people and I hope you don't mind is it's unpacking a little bit of, of your history, uh, and, and, you know, mm-hmm. for people that are maybe meeting you for the first time. Um, do you mind taking us back a little bit to, uh, to young Theo? Uh, growing up in a town that you've sure. you've said you're not a big fan of your hometown, just kind of taking us back to young Theo and and you know the words I remember you saying in in the documentary that I watched was that you're not necessarily a fan of your hometown or or maybe it's it, it's mixed emotions obviously. I think uh, it's still when I look back to that documentary which came out almost a year ago. When I think back to that moment, I remember seeing the final edit of the doc, and that was the part that was the most jarring to me and I really wrestled with Mm. that moment because I think my exact words are um I hate my hometown and I still do yes that's what you said I get like weirdly I get weirdly emotional still even saying it because it's not you know especially in the music industry everyone talks about where they're from and it's like this sense of pride and I just I don't I don't have that even still now you know I was just home over christmas uh my grandmother you know passed away and so I went home for the funeral and every time I go home there's just this really weird suffocating energy uh for mm-hmm. me so I grew up in the town of Coldale Alberta which is about 15 minutes from Lethbridge. Lethbridge is kind of the nearest big city. So about two and a half hours south of Calgary um, in a really, really strict, conservative kind of Christian environment. Um, Both my parents are very, very Dutch. Uh, So that's the only thing in my ancestry is is Dutch um, and Dutch reformed uh, Christian. So very, very strict. Um, So I was kind of raised in the church. CRC? Uh, it was actually, I love that, you know, CRC, <laughs> that's amazing. But, uh, it was actually even a step more reformed than CRC. It was okay. can RC. So Canadian okay. reformed, uh, which most people haven't even heard of. Um, but yeah, so, and for me, you know, growing up gay, um, and I'm, I've, you know, spoken to hundreds of gay men and we all have different stories about when our awareness of who we were intrinsically came about for me. I I always knew. I don't have mm-hmm. memories of not knowing. It wasn't, you know, 12, 13, 14. It wasn't when I was a teenager. It was, I always, I just always knew. Mm-hmm. I didn't necessarily know what it meant or how it kind of fit together, but I always knew that I was gay. I have memories mm-hmm. of being in kindergarten, so being four or five and knowing. So with that knowing was also kind of having the awareness that who I was meant going to hell. Mm-hmm. and kind of being raised in that, in that fear. Um, you know, Southern Alberta, even still, I think that it's come a long way in certain aspects, but, you know, for the most part in that town that I was born and raised in, like if you weren't a football player or a hockey player, you were immediately on the fringe and I never really fit the norm. Um, and I still don't, I think, now I've at 37, I finally gotten to the point that I'm excited about that. <laughs> I'm mm. excited. I'm a little left of center. Um, but for the longest time, it was this, there was so much shame attached to that. Mm. I wonder what that is about. The, I've heard that a lot about, and I don't want to, you know, throw small towns under the bus here when I say this, but small towns have typically gotten the rap as, as not being as open or as accommodating or as supportive to other, to people that are, that are, that are, are living differently than the, maybe the lives that they are. Mm-hmm. I think, uh, unfortunately, I think it's it really has come down to, <clears throat> you know, the concept of worldview, and their mm. worldview is 
Um, and I don't even necessarily blame them for it. You know, I was part of that too, where my worldview was so small. You know, for me, the idea of like going to the big city was, you know, once or twice a year, we'd go to Calgary and I would see people of color and I would see people who dressed differently. And, you know, I was so excited by this. And, but unfortunately, I don't think that's the case for a lot of people in those small communities. I don't think they're mm -hmm. excited by that. I think that there's, there's fear there, fear of what's different. Right. Um, so yeah, for me, I think, uh, it wasn't until I left for, for university, my first year of university, I went to Trinity Western, which is a Christian university in the lower mainland of, uh, BC, uh, in Langley, close to Vancouver. And, uh, it wasn't until then that I kind of felt like I was outside of that, maybe for the first time mm. and kind of, you know, seeing and being introduced to all of these different, you know, people and cultures and, that was a really hard year for me, but it was so transformative in that regard. I only went there for a year. I was 19 when I went there. And when I left that school, I think that's also where I, I feel like I left my faith behind a little bit, you know, in, in that, in that, in that way, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, totally does. I think I, I so I, I, I'm a church going guy. I actually, you, you, you said you're surprised about my understanding of CRC. I actually go to a CRC church here in Winnipeg. What? Um, yeah. No and, and uh, I've been there for 20 years. My, when I met my wife, uh, back then, uh, she said she's going to this church and we started connecting there. Now my understanding, this is funny. I, this might be off the record. I don't know, but, but, um, my understanding of, of, of CRC is that they are traditionally very traditional. And I remember one time I went as a representative because, because I feel like my church feels very non-denominational. It feels very community driven, very much like we all love each other and we embrace everybody. We've got people within our community that are gay, that we're very supportive of. And, and that to me, seems like a very non-CRC type of thing. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I, uh, I remember I went one time as a, as a representative of our church to the, the it's this big group meeting of all the churches called classes. Um, and I went there and I said, and they're talking about things and I'm, and I'm sitting in this room and I'm going, this feels nothing like the people that I'm with, that I hang out with. And I raised my hand and I said, what, this doesn't feel like a CRC where I, where I go, this, it's very different. And, and the words that were said to me was, well, we kind of tolerate what you guys do over there in Winnipeg. And I was like, that's very weird. Wow. So all these years, wow. I've not felt like a crc -er. I felt like a person who has faith in, in something greater than myself. Uh, but in terms of, of church and religion and, and the structure of church sometimes is so messed up, you know, I, I feel like it's so, mm -hmm. um, these structures and, and, and the, the, the humans that are running them, there's so much error and mistakes. And we have only to look to residential schools sometimes to just see, uh, how exactly. bad it was. And, and it's not a perfect picture for sure. Um, so when you say that you say, I mean, and I'm, I'm not trying to define what it is for you, but I, I get that. I get the idea of, of leaving, leaving that way of thinking because, um, I think it's very, very toxic and very wrong and, and can lead people down a, a really bad and, and, and a horrible path for themselves to think if I don't mm -hmm. be me, I'm going to go to hell. Right. As you say, like yeah. you felt like you couldn't be yourself. You had this choice of like, choose God or, or choose who I am. And that's a really, exactly. really terrible way to sort of paint that picture for you as a young man. I think, you know, unfortunately, that whole debate of God versus gay has, you know, been this, you know, Achilles heel of, of Christianity. Um, unfortunately, I think especially when you say, you know, the church and, and what that often means, um, you know, I think in some ways, like I say, when I left my faith behind, I feel like it was this survival technique, almost mm. in a sense. I knew that, uh, and believe me, I've had an, I've had many conversations with, um, you know, with Christians from my past and other Christians who, you know, still believe that uh, that being gay is wrong, and uh, it's it's very very challenging for me as someone that was raised in that church to, you know, not carry the guilt and shame which for me, led to, you know, a, a decade and a half of addiction and, you know, drinking. Mm -hmm. um, 
And it wasn't only, I've been sober for just over two years now. And it wasn't until, you know, the first maybe two or three months of sobriety, maybe less, maybe, you know, six to eight weeks that I kind of started to come back to God. But I feel like on my own terms and kind of get to know, um, you know, who God is in, in a grander sense. And, um, so yeah, that's been, you know, kind of a nice, a nice blessing, but, uh, it is really interesting, um, when, when those dynamics come into play for sure. There's a lot of words in your songs and lyrics that I feel have this like God element. There's this, there's this conversation that you're allowing us to be part of as you're wrestling with Mm. some of these things. And like, um, I, you know, we're all wrestling every day, all the time, either with, in our minds, with something external. Um, and I think that there's something so, I would say poignant and beautiful about how you share that conversation with us. Like, uh, I, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but I remember listening to some of your lyrics and going, oh, that's a, that's an interesting conversation happening that we're now privy of. Uh, because you've shared it with us. Mm. And, uh, and I think that's really quite cool uh, that you do that. Um, I don't know if that's conscious or subconscious, but it's, it's there. And I, and I witnessed it right away. I kind of, kind of resonate with me. And, um, and, and, and just so you know, my feelings are, you know, when, when, um, when you say that there, you know, there's Christians that, that think being gay is wrong. I'm not one of them. I, I think what's wrong is somebody not being fully themselves and being able Phew. to fully embody, <laughs> <laughs> embody who they are. And I feel like, <laughs> You know, some of my dearest friends are, 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 are gay, gay folks and, um, and I, and I love them dearly and I, and I, I would be sad for them should they not fully be who they are. I think, uh, you know, we only have a short amount of time on this earth and I think the more we spend on it being ourselves, the, the be- more beautiful our lives are going to be, you know, and, uh, and I'm, right. I'm, I, I'm so grateful that, that you've found, um, a way to fully embody who you are. And, and, you know, you mentioned a few minutes ago about addiction because that, that was, again, alcohol and, and drugs in general typically are, an, you, again, I'm stealing your words here, are a numbing agent, right? It basically can, if mm-hmm. there's pain there, you know, alcohol, drugs tends to sort of like mask it in some way, right? And, and, and push it aside right. or, or make you forget about it, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it was this you know, and, and I tell people all the time, you know, like the first, the physical act of not drinking once, you know, I had gone through the kind of, I had a really, really bad kind of 10 days to two weeks, two and a half weeks of withdrawal, Mm -hmm. um, which I was not expecting at all. Um, I knew that I was drinking too much. I was drinking daily. Uh, but I didn't really realize that my body had become physically dependent Mm -hmm. on alcohol. And that was terrifying going through the withdrawals and the shakes and the sweats and just feeling itchy all over and not being able to sleep. And Theo, how much uh, were you drinking uh, at the end? Oh my gosh. Uh, (laughs) I I only asked because I remember you saying in the documentary and it shocked the heck out of me. What's interesting is that I think I said in the documentary that I was probably drinking three or four bottles of wine a day. And I think it was, I think that was very much on the low end. Mm -hmm. I think it was probably closer to five or six. And that was just the wine. And I would be having beers at lunch, and I'd maybe have a shot or two at night. And so that was just the wine. It was definitely more than that. But I think the, the, the most scary part of that is that I was very rarely drunk. Mm. My, I had built my tolerance over the last 15 years. I had built my tolerance so high. And that's when, so when I had mentioned to certain friends of mine uh, that I, you know, I, I, there was four people that I called maybe two or three days into quitting. And I said, I just want to let you know that like, I'm, I am giving up drinking. And I think maybe one of them was like, okay, babe, like, good for you. You recognize it's a problem and I'm proud of you. But the other three were kind of like, what? Like, why? I was so very good at not ever letting on how much I was drinking, even with my partner, um, who, you know, I've lived with for the last eight, nine years, was, was clueless because I would drink when he was at work and I would take the bottles and I would put them out in the recycling on the street. And I was just very, very calculated 
you know, my producer who I've worked with for the last four or five years um, was shocked. And I was just like, and I remember telling him a story about how our first session together, um, when we ended up writing a song that we ended up releasing, I don't even, I don't remember that session. So I was either insanely hungover or I was still drunk from the night before, but I don't have memories really of that, of that session, which is, which is so scary to look back on for sure. I want to hear more about that, but first we're going to take a quick break. More with Theo here in just a moment on Through the Fire. What was the, uh, what was the, the, the catalyst that said, I need to change this. What was the, what was the moment for you? Was there, was it a number of things? Was it one moment? I think over the last, maybe the, the last two, three months of my drinking, there were, well, I would say, I mean, longer than that. I had known that my drinking was a problem for probably the last two, three years of my drinking, maybe even longer, but it's amazing the way that we justify our behavior. You know, uh, I think especially as artists, especially in the music industry where it's just the norm. You know, we don't have a job where you can't, you know, go to work a little tipsy. Like we're, if anything, it's celebrated. It's encouraged in a strange way. Um, You know, and for me, and I said it in the documentary that I, I just wore it like this badge of honor that I felt if I, you know, was addicted to this substance and I had all this pain and trauma and blah, 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 that maybe I'd be a, maybe I'd be a great artist finally, you know, and it's, it's so backwards in thinking. And on the other side of it, I or kind of still navigating my way through it. I, I see how messed up that is that way of thinking, but, um, it was, yeah, just, a a really great way to, to cope, I guess. When you talk about um, uh, alcohol being so prevalent in the music industry, I mean, I, I know that firsthand. I've, you know, I see it everywhere all the time, wherever I'm, I'm going. And, and there's almost like this, like, again, like you say this, oh, you're not drinking. And, and I think there's this feeling of like, if you're not, then you're, then you're other, you're, you're, you're different. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it, it's in a small micro way, kind of that, you're, oh, you're being different. Why? And, and then, then you get this sort of like accusatory of like, like, oh, you're not celebrating with us. And um, how, how have you navigated right. that over the last few years, uh, being in those circles still of, of it being prevalent and, and as somebody who is, uh, has had a really tough time with that in, in your history? God only knows, honestly. <laughs> like, I feel like it is still so challenging at times. Um, you know, for me, I, I definitely you know, with my partner who still drinks occasionally with my friends, some who are still, you know, quite heavy drinkers themselves. You know, I definitely kind of have my limit of, you know, once you've had three or four, then I'll remove myself. You're kind of just on a, and it's but by no judgment at all. I mean, who am I to judge drinking? Like drinkers are my people, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. I understand a drinker. Uh, so, you know, I, I definitely, it's just about boundaries for me. Um, and in terms of the industry, I think what I find so fascinating about when you quit alcohol specifically is that I find like alcohol is the only substance that you have to explain why you don't partake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, people want an explanation. You tell people you quit smoking and they're like, good for you. Right. You know, tell people you're going to lay off cocaine and they're just like strong choice, man. <laughs> you tell people that you're not going to drink anymore. And right. oh, why? You know, did something happen? Yeah. Uh, you know, is it OK if I drink? I like I saw this TikTok the other day and it was this sober guy who was talking about how um, he was like comparing drinking to just like any other substance. And he was like comparing it to like mayonnaise. And he was just like, imagine if you told people, you know what, like. I used to, for 20 years, I used way too much mayo. I just can't do mayo anymore, mm. you know? And for people to be like, oh, really? Like, is it okay if I use mayo? Mm-hmm. You know? And it's I think just, I saw it's that abs- one. It's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's absurd. And, uh, <laughs> you know, like, and uh, so navigating that has been tricky. And uh, I, I have friends who, you know, just this past summer, I kind of sent them a message and I'd be like, Hey, what's going on? Like, I haven't seen you in forever. And, uh, 
this friend of mine responded with, you know, like just the other day I was going to invite you out for drinks on a patio, but you know, I, I didn't know if that was okay. Mm. And, you know, I think for me, for anyone listening, if you have sober friends, invite them to the thing, Mm. you know, we still drink. We just don't drink alcohol, you know, like there's always options for us. We can still go and, you know, leave it for, for us to make that decision. But I just want to go back to that previous question because I don't even know if I fully answered it. But you said, what was there one thing? Was there one like catalyst to make me to make me stop? And I didn't even tell this story in the documentary. There was something that happened. So I quit December 6th. And at the end of October of 2020, I had gone out drinking uh, with a bunch of friends. Um, I remember two places that we went. um, But at that point of my drinking, like every single time I drank, I would black out. Um, So I had no idea kind of where we went. I woke up in the morning. Thank God I woke up at home. um, But like fully clothed with my shoes on, still in bed. Like I had just probably you know, barely made it in. And I remember waking up in such a panic and, you know, when just something, I don't know if you've ever had a hangover like that, where just something doesn't feel right. And you know, that something happened. Hopefully you've never had one like that. But I remember like going through my phone and like checking my bank statement to kind of track my steps and see like where I had gone. So I text my friends who I was with and they're just like, dude, we don't know you where you went. Like you left around midnight and So they don't know where I went. I don't know where I went. And I remember uh, going to the studio the next day to record and just feeling like a bag of shit and kind of going to the bathroom and and seeing that I had like bruises on my neck. And I was just like, that's strange. So I kind of pulled my shirt down and I was bruised and I was bruised on like the entire left side of my body. And I looked and I saw like bruises on my hips and I was like, that's weird. So I like dropped my pants and I was my entire left side from like my knee to my shoulder was bruised. And I was like, and I just started freaking out. Uh, So I went to emergency and I was just like, I'm completely bruised. And when you touched it, it didn't hurt. And I was just like, I don't know what happened. I don't know if I have internal bleeding, but what's going on. And I was so scared. And the doctor took me and he's just like, we need to do an ultrasound. We need to take you for x-rays. And uh, sorry, my dog is just going nuts right now. Georgia, lay down. I have two Great Danes, which is wild in a in an apartment. They they want to be on the podcast. Yeah, yeah, they really do. They're stars in their own right. Yeah. But, uh, so yeah, they did X rays and an ultrasound, and he came back and he was just like, everything looks fine. And I was like, well, then what's going on? And he said to me, it's just like, um, and I had explained to him that I had gone out drinking and I had blacked out and I don't remember anything. And he's just like you know, without being there and without you having a memory, he's like, the only time I've seen injuries like this is when someone's been hit by a car. And he's just like, I have a funny feeling that you were hit by a car and that you just don't know. And I just remember being like, whoo, like this is a lot to process. And then I still drank my face off for six weeks. And then finally, but I think that was, if there were to be one moment, that would kind of be it. And then, you know, I talk in the documentary about kind of walking my dog and catching my reflection in a storefront window and just having this, you know, I don't know if it was an act of God or this clairvoyant moment of just being like, you know, enough, enough, man. Like you have to, you have to believe even with the smallest spark or the smallest flame that, You are worth more than this, uh, than this life. And um, I came home and I cracked like one of my favorite uh, like double IPAs and I sipped it really slowly and I just was telling myself, this is it. This is the last one. And I thoroughly enjoyed that last drink and (laughs) haven't haven't looked back since. Right. Well, I'm glad uh, that you have have had those realizations. You know, my, I, I had a friend of mine, his name's Rob Nash on this show a while ago. And, and he, he, he had, um, when he was younger, he had, he'd got hit by a semi. Um, and he, so oh, he, wow. and he, he survived. Uh, and he often goes to school now and tells kids, don't wait till you get hit by a semi to change your life. Like take your life in your own hands kind of thing. Right. And, uh, you know, some, some, for some of us, it, it does take those 
big smacks in life to kind of wake us up and um uh, you know whether it was a car or not um in some ways that was a a, a, a rebirth and it sounds like you know the way it, it, it mm -hmm. i'm interpreting it over here um and uh when i think about that i, I sometimes think about it's interesting, and I've shared this on the podcast before, when people who have suffered through, uh, lived through, survived through addictions, um, I know with AA, uh, you often hear people say, after having not touched a drink for 30 years, they'll get up to the microphone and say, my name is so-and-so, and I'm an addict. And there's, that mm -hmm. piece of who they are stays with them. And I often think about this. I think about tragedies befall us all the time in our lives. And I think how... Do you have a do you have a method or, or a way that you can say to yourself or prepare yourself for when you know you just said your recently your your grandmother passed away and when mm -hmm. we go through tragedies in life that those are slippery slopes right where we, where it's, it be, it could become easy for us to fall into the pits again right. um, is there anything that you do that that kind of steals yourself for those moments that come up in life or um, or is there any something else that helps you with that resolve in a way you know I think for me. The one thing that has been so, I guess, a shift in perspective, and it's really been new, maybe the last three, four months is to, you know, shift my perspective from, you know, this pursuit of happiness to, mm -hmm. to always find things to make me happy and do things that make me happy and try to live a happy life. And I just realized last year, especially, or this, yeah, 2022, I experienced a lot of loss. Um, you know, three grandparents passed away within about a seven month stretch. And uh, I had lost, you know, a few friends, not life or death, but just we had fallen out uh, due to the fact that I'm sober now, and we didn't have a lot in common anymore. And uh so it was just a really a, a tough year in that regard. And I remember having this, this moment to say, you know, life doesn't always grant us happiness. In fact, I think it almost rarely does. Those mm -hmm. moments of happiness are so fleeting, especially as we get older and we have kids uh, and we see the struggles that they're, they're growing up with. It's such a difficult world for them now. And um, so I shift my perspective from happiness to contentment, mm. which I feel like we don't talk about as humans, really, what mm -hmm. contentment means. And for me, it's just been this process of, can I still find moments of peace and contentment within moments of sadness and anger and frustration? And, you know, without sounding too Oprah about it, can I, can I find, uh, can I find moments to just be thankful for the human experience and the spectrum of emotions? And mm -hmm. once I really started to kind of shift my perspective that way, I found the more moments of happiness there was. So mm -hmm. I feel like when we chase happiness, when we think happiness is around the corner, sometimes we just keep running. And I think the key for me was to allow myself to be happy now and content now, regardless of what's going on in, in my life. You know, I, I read something the other day and I, I'm just pulling it up on my phone as you're speaking here. And, um, and it's this, uh, this quote that came up and said, there's a belief that there is some future moment more worth our presence than the one we're in right now. And that's why mm -hmm. we miss our lives. And I just said, that's exactly I, it. Yeah. And it's just, it's, it's, it's like contentment. It's being present in the moment that you're in right now. And that's something I, I, I'm a father. I got three kids uh, aged 11, seven, and mm. three. Uh, they're, they're crazy uh, and they make my life crazy. Uh, but I think oftentimes my MO is be present where I am, you know, as a musician, I'm, I'm traveling, I'm always uh, uh, on the road and away from them. And I, and I miss them dearly, but I also kind of, wherever I am, I'm, I'm really just trying to be there and be present. I mean, now, albeit I'm away and I'm in a hotel room and I'm living a nice life away from my kids. So it's not like, like I'm in, in the trenches or anything like that. So it's, it's pretty right. easy for me to be sitting in a hot time going, my life is pretty great. But, right. but you know, in, in, 
in the context of, I, I mean, my heart still longs to be with my kids no matter where I am, but, and I'm, and, you know, just to be full disclosure, I'm home a lot. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not uh, on, on the road, you know, definitely not more than a hundred days a year uh, as a father, right. but, but even that might, might be a long, a lot on the road, but, um, but yeah, I think that that hits the nail on the head for me is, is contentment and being present in the moment you're in right now that can lead to, like you say, the happiness and joy that, that we, that we so long to, to get to in the future, but really, I think it's always present if we just tap into it in, in the moment we're in right now. Yeah, exactly. I think it's been such a, such a learning curve for me. Um, and then also I think, you know, another thing that was, was so just, I guess, gratifying in a, in a strange way was, and I'm, I'm curious for you too, what that's been like. Um, in the music industry, which is so, you know, ever evolving, it's moving so quickly. And I feel like as soon as we as artists get a handle on one platform, there's all of a sudden another one that we have to start tackling. And, um, you know, the, the, all of these ways of, you know, branding and promoting. And, you know, for me, the one thing that I had to come down to is like, what is my, never mind the public, never mind the industry. Um, but what is my personal definition of success and what does that look like? And, um, believe me, this is something that I've, I've kind of worked through in, in therapy and, uh, was just such a, a life changing thing to actually sit with and be like, well, what is it actually? What is my definition of success? Um, and that's kind of what I, I, I tell everyone now, any chance I get to have a real conversation with, with a friend or a family member, I say, so many of our, our issues and our problems can be solved if we just ask ourselves that question. What does success really look like to us? And are we chasing, chasing you know, the, the right things? When we're 85, 90, you know, on our way out, are we going to look back and be like, I'm so glad that I put effort into that? Uh, you know, and I think especially as, as artists, we're, we're so caught up in, you know, numbers and followers and, you know, where we stand on the charts and sales and streams. And it's so easy to get lost and to start to attaching value to those things. Really? Um, but yeah, because, I'm curious, what's it, what's it like for you that way? Well, when you say that, I mean, it's, it's just the nature of the business, right? It's like, it's, it is a numbers game and, and like you matter more based on how much numbers you get. You matter more. I'm using in quotations when I say that in right. terms of the way the industry sees you. I've started saying, you know, like I can't control my chart positions. I can't control who likes me, who doesn't like me. I can't control where a song, how many streams it gets, all those things. I mean, there are certain things you can do and and that's what led me to, to this way of thinking was control what I can and let go of what I can't. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's something it. every day Ooh. that I'm in practice. And then the other thing is, as you mentioned success, I've always, I remember for a long time, probably in the last five or six years, this has shifted for me, was that success was when this happens. Success is when this happens. And I stopped thinking that way and started thinking success is here, just like, just like contentment. It's success is here right now. Right. Because if we keep attaching success to what's to come, then we're going to miss the success we're having right now. And th this is to me a success. You and I having a great conversation like this. I'm, I'm going to walk away from this feeling fulfilled and, you know, having my cup filled in our, in the moments Absolutely. that we're sharing together. And, and I think, um, you know, I, I, it's really about, again, letting go of the things I can't control and just allowing this moment to be a successful moment. Uh, and, and, and mm -hmm. re refreshing that hit refresh in my brain, every, every new moment I'm in and going, th this is successful. And, you know, meanwhile, there's bills to be paid. There's a debt somewhere hanging over my head that I got a credit card bill I got to pay somewhere. But because I'm not getting to that right now, does that mean I'm unsuccessful? Does, does because so-and-so has more followers than me, does that make me unsuccessful? I don't think so. Um, I, I, in right. fact, I know so. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's been my sort of idea around, around the, some of those things. Right. Amazing. I love that. I can like message my therapist now and be like, I can skip this week. <laughs> I, I chatted with Don. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I know it's funny because as as the host of a show, it, it I it, it does it's easy to come across as like I've got it all figured out, but I I really don't. Uh, but I'm somebody who is uh, constantly encouraged and inspired by the story of others, and um, and I think mm. every time I get to do have this, these moments with with the guests on my show. I always walk away with a little bit more, a uh, little more strength uh, and a little more uh, understanding 
of, of the world around mm-hmm. me and, and maybe how I can approach it from here. And, uh, and I think you give somebody like myself and, you know, I know the listeners will be pleased to hear uh, some of your thoughts and ideas about all of these things that you've shared with us today. So Theo, I, I can't thank you enough for this. I, uh, I'm grateful for the time that we get to share here. And, uh, and I look forward to sitting down with you one day and actually meeting you face to face and not on a computer screen. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Such a pleasure. Thank you for yeah. having me. Our pleasure. Thank you. On my next episode, I've got a guest that I'm certain you'll know. She's an accomplished musician and an incredible songwriter. Not to mention she and I both share a deep affinity for John Mayer's album, Continuum. Join me for a conversation with Miss Lindsay L on the next episode of Through the Fire. Thanks for listening. As I always say, it takes a village to run things here at Through the Fire. And I want to thank my village, executive producer Sarah Burke, administrators Lori Brown and Alan Gray Eyes, video and audio design by Chris Godry and his team at 44 Films, feisty creative for their design work, social media support by Johnson Design Company, and last but far from least, I want to thank our technical producers, Matt Kundle and Evan Serminski from the Sound Off Media Company. I look forward to sharing more great conversations just like this one on the next Through the Fire. You see the light. Produced and distributed by the Sound Off Media Company.